Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, October 23rd, 1955, President Eisenhower stands up for the first time after a heart attack a month prior. You see what we did there, listeners? We actually missed the day of Eisenhower's heart attack, so we're finding a hook for it, which is this day when he's when he's on the mend. But, uh, but look, this is the story, uh, not just of Eisenhower's heart attack, which we'll talk about, but how a staff around a president reacts to a moment when a president takes ill and has a serious health crisis, how they share information with the press and so forth, and obviously something that we are thinking about in the wake of Donald Trump having the coronavirus and the way that that was handled with the public and the press. So here to discuss, as always, is Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Jody. And back with us is Will Hitchcock, professor of history at the University of Virginia. His podcast is Democracy in Danger, and he wrote a book about Eisenhower. What a coincidence that you're here. Uh, It's called The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s. Will, thanks for coming back. Great to be with you again. So now that we can dispense with our oh-so-clever intro, let's just actually go back to the date in question, September 23rd, right? Uh, What happens to President Eisenhower on Friday, September 23rd? Well, yeah. So uh, it's been a month since Eisenhower had a pretty serious heart attack. And, you know, think about what it's like when a president suddenly is struck down. We, we've just passed through this. So we all we all know what a shock it can be, whether you like the president or, or voted against the president. It doesn't matter. There's something there's a, a sense a sort of a jolt of electricity that goes yeah. through the nation when the president falls ill. So Ike, the, on this day, finally, after a, a month of recuperation, is actually able to walk unassisted across uh, his hospital room a few feet, and that's about it. So clearly, he's still quite hmm. ill from this very serious heart attack. And what are the details of the heart attack itself? What went down um, on that day? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, Eisenhower, uh, it, whether you, most people don't really have a very clear sense of Ike, you know, he's some guy in the in the 50s and, you know, he was probably really old. And in fact, he, he was at the time thought to be quite elderly to run for office. Get this, he was 62 when he became president, <laughs> which is uh, which is which is interesting because nowadays 62 is not thought to be very old. But he was on the old side for the 50s. He didn't have great health. He had some heart problems earlier in his life. He'd been a chain smoker, and you know, so he's he's. Uh, Probably ought to have been taking things uh, a little bit carefully, but he was very active. He loved golfing. He loved hunting. He loved shooting guns. He goes off to Denver in uh, August of 1955. He's going to get away from Washington. He's going to relax, right? He's going to have a quiet, peaceful vacation. And he plays a ton of golf and he goes fishing and all is going well. Suddenly he's out on the, the golf course. He's played 18 holes. He has lunch. He goes back out onto the golf course and he starts feeling chest pains. Goes home, goes to bed, wakes up at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of a heart attack, searing pain in his chest. His wife takes one look at him, Amy Eisenhower says, oh goodness, and calls the doctor who comes rushing in and says, I'm going to give you some morphine, go back to bed. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of peak 50s medicine. (laughs) The good old days, right? (laughs) The good old days. Just just, here's a pill, it'll it'll be fine. Turns out that he's had a heart attack, but they don't quite know this yet because they haven't administered the EKG. They do that the next day. So actually... It's like 12 hours before they actually realize that he's had a pretty major heart attack. Mm -hmm. He's then bundled off to an army hospital nearby in Denver. And there, he is essentially shrouded in an oxygen tent. He is, you know, he's kind of 
looming in and out of consciousness. Whoa, the free, leader of the free world in the middle of the 1950s, which is a very dangerous time in the Cold War, is like out of it yeah. and really not not reporting for duty. Yeah. Nikki, you want to jump in on any elements of that story? So you can kind of imagine what the doctor is feeling that next day because he's treating this as no big deal when he comes over that night, right? He administers a little bit of medicine and then by the next afternoon, he's a lot more worried (laughs) and he takes the president of the United States to the hospital and realizes he's largely misdiagnosed him in his first visit. Um, And to, to bear in mind, I mean, we have all of these ways that we treat heart attacks now. But at the time, like 30 to 40 percent of people who had a major heart attack died. So this was pretty serious and pretty risky for the president. Um, And perhaps no surprise then that after an event like this, he would be pretty much out of it um, long term, the the way that we saw. Yeah. Um, Will, what is your sense of how much it matters that he was not in Washington when all this goes down. Well, first off, let me point out that in reading some of the details here, he's taking a pretty long vacation and he seems right. to be golfing a lot, right? I think uh, I think he has his heart attack on his second round of golf on that day and he's like just off in Denver golfing. But my real question is, um, is not why did he golf so much and why do we care about why presidents golf so much? But my real question is, you know, does, does it make a difference that he's not – in Washington, not near Walter Reed, not, not, you know, not home in every sort of sense. Well, first, I got to rescue Ike's reputation. The, okay. the biggest golfer in the White House was Woodrow Wilson, it turns out. <laughs> some, somebody actually crunched the numbers, and Wilson golfed even more than Ike. But yeah, so he's, he's been away from Washington uh, for seven weeks. He's in his seventh week of vacation. I mean, it's, it's by contemporary standards, it's kind of crazy. He was going every day to the local um, army base to do a couple of hours of work. But yeah, he's not he's not in uh, Washington. And that means that he's not only far away from Walter Reed and from perhaps better medical care, but he's also he's also away from the cabinet. He's also away from the vice president. He's he's away from the apparatus of the White House and of the media apparatus. So it's a tiny little group of people in uh, the army hospital in Denver that basically start to run the command center like, whoa, the president's sick. Who you know, who's in charge now? And there's about a week where it's not altogether clear who's in charge. Can you imagine that? Like a week where nobody really knows who's running the country? And I do think the fact that he's all the way out in Denver allows this to happen in some ways. And and I don't want to say he was like president in absentia for those seven weeks to begin with. But there is this kind of um, decentralized nature of his presidency in that moment anyway. But he doesn't trust his vice president to run the country either. And that's the other big issue is that we tend to think of, oh, something happens to the president, the vice president takes over. Richard Nixon is twiddling his thumbs in Washington and nobody is handing him power. In fact, they're trying very hard not to give him any major responsibilities during this. I mean, he's pretty young as a vice president and doesn't really know what he's supposed to be doing either. So it's a, it's a little chaotic in retrospect. Yeah, it's super mushy. And we don't have the 25th Amendment yet. It's not altogether clear how power might be transferred if uh, Eisenhower doesn't recover. And all of his staff, and this is common with any president who's injured, all of their loyalty is to the president. Zero Mm -hmm. of their loyalty is to the vice president. And so the vice president is like, you know, the proverbial, you know, Banquo's ghost. Like nobody wants the vice president around because he represents a transfer of power. And what's interesting is that Richard Nixon wrote a lot about this later in his career, about how embarrassing it was to be vice president at that moment, because he himself knew that he should never appear to be taking Ike's shoes like the cabinet would meet in Washington while he was sick, while Eisenhower was sick. Nixon was like, don't sit at the end of the table where the president sits. Stay in my vice presidential chair and my role. Like he actually wanted to diminish his authority because people would say, don't you dare try to seize the the mantle of Eisenhower. And I think that's not uncommon. You know, when President Trump fell ill, nobody really knew exactly what Mike Pence was doing. Where was he? Was he in charge or wasn't he? And they didn't want to address that problem. Yeah. The 25th Amendment, which, as, as you said, was sort of supposed to clear this up, but doesn't actually clear this up. Um, that doesn't come around until 1965. And I think people generally think of it as coming around in the wake of the Kennedy assassination. Was there any talk in the wake of this of saying, oh, wait a minute, we kind of don't really have regulations? Yeah, there, there totally was a lot of talk about it. And in fact, Eisenhower privately uh, talked about it because it wasn't just the heart attack. He then, you know, within a year, he had to have a pretty major abdominal surgery to deal with a problem that, that he had in his, in his abdomen. Um, he even had a, a little 
minor stroke uh, in, in 1957. So he, he realized that we needed to have some kind of like, to, you know, handbook, you know, in case of emergency, break glass, because it could be that the president, you know, wouldn't just drop dead, but might be incapacitated, still alive, but incapacitated. Right. That's what he was worried about. So he wrote to Nixon and he said, you know, Mr. Vice President, this is what I think we should do in case of uh, some kind of emergency. But that didn't have any legal standing. That was just a personal letter to, to Nixon. And and it was immediately upon uh, upon Ike's uh, departure from office that the Congress began discussing, well, how should we really deal with this problem? And then the Kennedy assassination, you know, was just a, a, another reminder of how urgent the problem was. Like if the president dies, we need to know um, immediately what, what to do. And the question of just immediate succession upon the president's death, that was relatively easy to deal with. It was more of that intermediate period about illness or incapacity. And it's wild that this wasn't clear yet at this point. Because if you look at the early 20th century and the history of presidents, they were not in great shape. You mentioned Woodrow Wilson as a major golf player, but he was also somebody who was incapacitated for his last year in office. FDR was not looking great at the end of his third term and dies very early in the start of his fourth term. Like There had been some pretty serious presidential illnesses and incapacitations that nobody had really addressed yet. It's interesting that it took Ike to sort of push it over the line. I mean, one of my thoughts reading about this and thinking about this is is almost like we should normalize transfer of powers a little more so that it's just a little more natural that when someone is under surgery or someone is incapacitated, the vice president would step in or there would be some other power structure step in. But obviously, as you're describing, the people who become presidents are not the ones who are comfortable with giving up power and being loose around notions of power. It's probably why I will never be president either. Um, but yeah, if it was just sort of more common practice for the vice president to have a robust role, then in this situation, people wouldn't freak out as much or have all these big questions when a president isn't able to, to, to play that role. And that's something that does happen, Jody, later on, right? That Ronald Reagan, after he gets shot, there's some confusion over what should happen. Um, and then they clarify it and they kind of have a letter on file so that if they go under anesthesia, yeah. you just you transfer power over to the vice president during that period of time that you're under anesthesia. And that's actually happened several times since the 1980s. But it, it hasn't registered as that big of a deal because there's now a, a process for it. You know, I think one thing that's worth uh, thinking about, too, is that, you know, d- different presidents handle their incapacity differently. I mean, you mentioned Reagan, Nikki, and of course, you know, he'd been he'd been shot and nar- had to have surgery, you know, narrowly missed uh, being killed. But he turned that to his advantage. The old media pro, you know, he, as soon as he could stand up, he got the, the, the pajamas and the robe and he was at the window waving and all the rest of it. You know, Eisenhower was too ill to do that. It would take a month, you know, it would take more than a month for him to get up and at him. He was finally wheeled out onto a sun deck wearing a gift that he'd been given by the press corps, which was these bright red pajamas with the words much better thing. Uh, embroidered in the pocket of his of his pajamas and you know they the the press came around they took some photographs but then he was wheeled right back in because he really wasn't able to 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 deal with you know a press conference so you know president trump you know who was ill he sort of springs back and suddenly he wants to some people reported that he wanted to 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 come out of the hospital with a superman shirt on to demonstrate his his virility and and vitality (laughs) so the question of how the president wants to show both his weakness but also his recovery tells you something about who they are so he he had embroidered on his shirt it said much better thanks because people kept asking him how are you feeling I have a friend who made a T-shirt that said "Good and you," and it just said "Good and you" on the shirt because. And, um, but I really like that trick a lot. Um, okay, so we've talked about his inner circle, um, who has a certain kind of loyalty, and we've talked about the vice president, who has a certain kind of loyalty, and the allegiances there. And I suppose we're kind of going in the order of who the president's people feel loyalty to, and. The next people on the list are like the American public and even the press. I mean, we haven't mentioned them yet. How forthright are they with their constituents about what happened to Ike? Yeah, I mean, the the cabinet and the press um, secretary made a really successful effort to demonstrate frankness and candor with Eisenhower. They held frequent press conferences. They trotted out a variety of medical doctors and experts to say, well, um, uh, heart disease is a serious problem in America. And and they wanted to give the impression that Ike was fine. He was just needed a little time to recover. All was well. The reality we now know is that he was much sicker than they let on. So they did a pretty mm-hmm. good job of sort of hiding the realities. But, you know, this is in an era in which the media is, 
in a sense, a partner in governance with the presidency. And the adversarial relationship that we associate today is just not in place yet. And the, the, the press uh, respected his privacy. They reported, um, you know, pleasant little stories about Mamie coming and, and the son John coming and, and chatting and so forth. But they really didn't pry so much as to show that Eisenhower was a very ill man. In fact, all they started to do was say, will he run for president or not? That was the that was the subject. Will he run for re-election in 1956? That became the, the story everybody wanted to talk about while Ike was kind of hidden from view, which is a fascinating, almost Shakespearean kind of setup, like the king is ill, but he, but no one really knows. Is he, is he ill or is he just uh, faking it? And right. all of his lieutenants are out there talking about who should run if Ike doesn't. It's a wonderful sort of drama that the press really leaned into uh, in the period of Ike's illness. I mean, the the thing about the people around Ike is that they developed the ability to seem transparent. They were handing over what looked like a lot of information about the president's health while not actually giving a full picture of his health. And so in a way, they're helping to set the standards of transparency, uh, higher expectations of what we know about the president's health. But because you don't have that adversarial press, they're able to get away with you know, painting a much rosier picture than um, might have actually been the case. But how much of that is built into just the fact that, I mean, these are the president's doctors. I mean, how much can you expect a doctor who's talking about the president um, to not be at the whim of some level of political forces? I mean, I think it's reasonable for the president to to make political judgments about how much information um, he wants to reveal. Uh, You know, for Eisenhower, it's the mid 50s. Cold War is extremely uh, unstable. Um, you know, they're they're anxious. They talk about the Red Scare and the and the a- atomic scare. There's a a feeling that the adversaries may take advantage of the illness of a president. That's probably true at any time, but it was especially true in the mid 50s. And so it's not. I think we can expect uh, that you know doctors and the, and an ill president are going to be pretty careful about how they frame the illness and how they frame the time to recovery. Uh, that said, though, Eisenhower was popular when he was elected. He was extraordinarily popular when he was reelected, and his popularity soared right after his illness. Hmm. So he was able to use that to his advantage to essentially say, look, I'll get back to you when I'm ready to get back to you. Meanwhile, you can just keep up the adulation. And it didn't hurt him politically. The Eisenhower story is a fascinating one because this is a serious illness, but he's on the campaign trail the next year getting ready to run for re-election. And it's that popularity that buoys him, right? Like he remains just a fantastic fantastically popular president throughout his presidency, and he wins re-election pretty handily. Um, So while we look at this incident, and it raises all of these questions, and his continuing illnesses um, into 56 and into 57, it doesn't have any real effect on his popularity. And we look back at him, and and it feels like you're staring back at a distant time, not only because he's able to sort of um, sidestep a lot of these health questions, but man, imagine having a president this popular. It's almost difficult to imagine. Also, you know, an illness in the White House uh, can be politically advantageous if you play your cards right. It's okay if you already have established your reputation in this kind of powerful masculine way. Uh, No one had more, you know, military honors and so on than Eisenhower. But then he was able to sort of demonstrate that he could be vulnerable. And that actually served to increase his popularity. So, it's just one of those little sort of surprises that you you can sometimes demonstrate yourself to be human, and that can enhance your political appeal. Um, okay, well, that's a good place to leave it. So, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Will Hitchcock, thanks for doing this. Thanks for doing the last episode. This has been a blast. And I will say your podcast is Democracy in Danger. The book is The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s. But uh, thanks again for doing this. It was a ton of fun. Thank you. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of the Radiotopia Network from PRX. Jacob Feldman is our researcher and producer. Brittany Brown is our producer as well. Thanks to everyone who has been in touch with ideas and comments and questions about the show, including, I just want to say, the number of you who have pointed out that for a week or so there, some folks were getting a really long stretch of ads at the top of the show, and I think we found a fix to what was going on. We're chatting with Radiotopia about it. Obviously, we need to run ads during this show, but thank you to all the listeners who have been reaching out about the uh, the listener experience with that. Anyway, you can uh, stop commenting on iTunes about it, and maybe if you want, you can go ahead and leave a comment about a recent episode or whatever. And if you want to send us an email, it's thisdaypod at gmail.com. We are also on social at thisdaypod. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.
Radiotopia. From Peace.